Today's sermon on this World Communion Sunday is God's church stands for truth. God's church stands for the truth. We're going to be turning, uh, picking up where we've been moving through Luke's gospel from the sermon from two weeks ago. We read about John's query through two disciples and literally through two witnesses under the Deuteronomic standard sent to Jesus to ask, you know, are you the one who is to come or should we look for another? Now we're continuing with that passage and we're going to be reading today from Luke chapter 7 verses 24 through 28. We'll move on to the next segment of this uh, larger pericope next Sunday. And today we're also turning to the Apostle Paul's first letter to Timothy, who of course was the pastor in Paul's protege, the pastor in Ephesus. So uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. I invite you to turn your attention with me. If you have your Bible, open your Bible. We'll also have the scripture up on the screen. Uh, to First to Luke, and then to 1 Timothy. Hear now God's word. When John's messengers had gone, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. This is John the baptizer, John the Baptist. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go to see? A man, a man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who are dressed in splendid clothing and live in luxury are in king's courts. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And then to 1 Timothy. I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Beloved, this is the word of God. Thanks be to God. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. I'm going to open today with three word pictures and points of reference, words or phrases, and they are these, unshaken by the wind, unshaken by the wind, standing, standing, and true north. Uh, just go ahead and go to the middle one. Just let me remind you that the, the Greek term for the resurrection, anastasis, means to stand again, okay? To, 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 in other words, to be dead and to stand again and ultimately to stand in the presence of God. That's what the resurrection is talking about. Today we're going to look a little bit more, though, from different angles at unshaken by the wind, standing, as far as like a building and a proclamation, and then true north. Now, let me take you to where I was about nine, ten days ago. I was walking through some land, um, and there's all kinds of goldenrod all over the place, if we can go to that. Yeah, so you can see, actually, I took this photo about a half mile into my journey. But before I began this journey, I can tell you this. Uh, smartphones are both uh, very good or very dangerous, depending on how you use them. One nice uh, app in uh, my iPhone that I have, it's probably in your smartphone too, is a compass. And on the compass, the, I can go to the app, 
and it can ask me, it asked me, its default set it to magnetic north. But I have to tell you, I was going to be wandering through some land where there aren't really many markers, and I was going to be kind of on a windy day, and that goldenrod is about, you know, I'm not very tall, that goldenrod is about chest high on me. I'm, by the way, flushing out deer as I'm walking through this area and headed towards a little mountain beyond here. And so I set my compass in my phone on not magnetic north. I didn't want the default. I wanted true north. Because I have to admit to you, I'm not a surveyor, and I'm not walking out through this field with a bunch of charts where I can make adjustments off a of magnetic north. I don't need the way the earth and the world is tilted. I, I need to know true north, as in the North Pole, versus, you know, little variations on that. So I set my compass on true north, and it was a good thing I did, because once I got about a half mile into walking over a mile in one direction, it was good to know where the north was, right? I needed a true north. And as you can see in this photo, and as I'm telling you, it was kind of windy. So I didn't want to follow and be a reed uh, shaken by the wind. I wanted to be a reed unshaken by the wind. And I wanted to know what true north is. Because I confess to you, I can be thrown off. And I have to tell you, pastorally, I know this because the Bible tells me this, and I know this pastorally, you can be thrown off a little bit. And you need to know, and I need to know, what true north is. Because we are dealing with a world that is shaken and distracted by many strong winds these days. Uh, some of you don't know this, but I kind of keep up with local culture, and I can tell you that uh, last night there was a fairly significant football game here. It was significant for the Alabama Crimson Tide. I don't know how significant or what the significance was for Mississippi State University. We did score some points, which was good, uh, but we lost the game. But speaking of football, you may have read the autobiographical book by Tim Tebow, the great former Heisman Trophy winner, uh, football player, SEC commentator, called Shaken. In that book, Tim Tebow says this, while many know about my career highs, few know the details of the lows, like having to learn that God's plans are bigger and better than mine. It hasn't been easy, but I'll say that in those places of doubt and even darkness, I realized who I am has nothing to do with wins or losses, applause, or negative criticism. It has to do with whose I am. Knowing this, I can live out what the king of ancient Israel wrote in Psalm chapter 16, verse 8. And what does that say? What does David's psalm say? I have set the Lord continually before me. In other words, my focus is on the Lord God Almighty as my true north. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. I will not be shaken. These are times in which many are shaken. If you come on Wednesday nights, you know, and I refer to these resources I'm going to give you now briefly, um, in various parenting discussions and life application discussions that we do in deeper discipleship discussion on Wednesday nights. But remember, Jean Twinge's book, which the subtitle pretty much tells you where she's going with this. Now, this is not a Christian book. This is not a Christian author. This is not an inspirational book, so I'm not recommending it to you as a devotional guide, but it is an important resource. Twinge is pretty much the specialist on the I generation, that is the, the little sub-generation that would be anywhere from upper elementary these days through the 20-somethings, you know, and definitely people who are at high school and college right now, the I gen, and you understand why she calls the group the I gen. Um, why today's super connected kids are growing up less rebellious, more tolerant, less happy, and completely unprepared for adulthood and what that means for the rest of us. That's her book that came out about four or five, five years ago that I referred to in some parenting discussions a few years ago. I can return to it later, but uh, what she's dealing with and what a number of folks are dealing with now is this alarming rise in mental health issues in the iGen. 
I mean, things that used to be single digits statistically in sociological and psychological surveys are now not only double digit, but approaching 30, 40, even 50% in the group of young people who are currently teenagers and early 20-somethings. Widespread cases of anxiety through the roof, depression through the roof, suicide and suicidal ideation through the roof. Again, used to be single digits, now we're talking multiple, all over the place. Addictions, rejections of biological gender and basic biological points of reference, and other self-harm patterns. And then the irony of it all is that this arises almost kind of in an odd negative synergy with the the reality that we're trying to keep young people much safer now than we used to and parents are in this hyper you know parachute mom mode which brings us to another resource the coddling of the american mind again this is not a christian resource this is by a a, a social psychologist and a constitutional specialist uh height and lukianoff greg lukianoff jonathan height the coddling of the American mind. What they see, what Haidt particularly sees as a social psychologist is how good intentions and bad ideas are setting up a generation for failure. Again, these are not Christian books. This is not a preacher writing these books. These are psychologists and constitutional specialists. And what we're dealing with here, I mean, by the way, if you are trying to raise a child without connecting with biblical resources and these kind of resources we're trying to ground you in, you're flying blind. Come on, get, get, you know, understand. We're not just supposed to say, wow, I don't understand how all this is going on. We are called to seek understanding by God's guidance. What we're dealing with is, a, is winds of the world, not just winds out in a field, winds of the world, winds of culture, And, for that matter, politicians' wins and marketers' wins. They blow a lot of wind. It's coming your way. It's coming your children's way. And, and, and of course, more specifically, what we're talking about are wins of new, so-called new standards for us all. A new way of seeing ourselves. New standards, new ways of understanding, new teaching. And that new teaching not only is out in the world, it increasingly seeps into and then becomes a flood in the so-called church among Christians and in Christian families and households. Most definitely in compromised churches and among compromised leaders and compromised parents for that matter. God's word in Ephesians chapter four, verse 14 says, we are not to be children tossed to and fro by waves, carried about by every, catch this, wind of teaching. Every current wind of teaching out in the world and even in the so-called church. Now we're going to turn now to our central passage from Luke chapter 7, verses 24 through the beginning of verse 28. And here, what we just read about is Jesus asked Three, catch that, that's not by accident, three questions, rhetorical questions about John the Baptist. And flowing from that, Jesus identifies John as the ultimate Old Testament prophet, the ultimate Old Testament prophet. Jesus, first of all, asks this question to the people. Remember, Jesus is in Galilee. John is in Perea at Machaerus in prison. John has sent his messengers to Jesus. Go back to the sermon two weeks ago and listen to how Jesus responds to John. But now Jesus is talking to the crowd around him. And he asks this question, what did you go out in the wilderness to see? And then he asks this question that is multi-level and it's, it, I can tell you this, it's, it's quite ironic and humorous what Jesus is asking. What did you go out to the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? Now, a couple things you can pretty much catch off the top here. Number one, obviously, uh, 
John the Baptist is not commonplace. Reeds were all over the place. They're kind of a marker for Galilee and going down to the Sea of Galilee uh, where Jesus is basing this you know, central part of his early ministry. So Jesus says, is John commonplace? Is he just kind of one of a million? And the answer is obviously no. On top of that, of course, as you can read, Jesus is saying, is, is John like easily swayed and bent by the cultural winds? And the answer to that rhetorical question is obviously no. John is not swayed. He's not a weak reed blown like most people are by what's going on. Well, everybody else is saying this. I, have to, I guess I have to go along with this. John is not that guy. He is not a reed shaken by the wind. So that's two aspects of this word picture. But let's go deeper. Jesus is actually speaking to politicians and the political world, which is relevant nowadays for us too, right? And to marketers for that matter, but really to politicians, because politicians are basically marketers, okay? And Jesus is speaking specifically to, he's poking at, if you will, Herod Tetrarch, Herod Antipas, who has John imprisoned in uh, Perea, in Machaerus, okay, the Machaerus, underneath Machaerus, fortress and palace, but Herod, who is also the ruler under the Roman Empire for the region in which Jesus operates now, Galilee. So uh, let's go to our photo. Here's, here's my photo that I wanted to give to you. This is the first coin minted by the son of Herod the Great, Herod Antipas, to uh, proclaim his rule over Galilee as well as Perea, and it's really Galilee-oriented on this coin. Notice this. First of all, on the left, you will notice you've got the name Herod Tetrarch, okay? And in the middle, typically with a Roman Empire type coin, you would have the bust of the ruler, the image of the ruler. But you don't have the image of Herod Antipas there. You have instead, what is that in the middle? Does anybody know? Can you tell what that is? That is a reed. That is the symbol that Herod Antipas has claimed for himself and his reign, particularly over Galilee, saying Galilee's beautiful, it's full of reeds. And uh, by the way, on the other side of the coin, you'll notice it says Tiberius. Uh, that is the capital city that, uh, that uh, Herod has built out on the Sea of Galilee on top of, in some areas, Jewish graves, which made it a defiled city. You'll notice in the Gospels, you never read about Jesus going to Tiberius, even though he's very close never goes to Tiberius, it's totally defiled, is an atrocity to, the, to faithful Jews. So G Jesus right now is seriously poking at Herod Antipas and saying, is John like Herod? No way, he's the polar opposite of Herod who has become outraged at his teaching and uh, Herod's uh, you know, uh, declaiming of Herod's adulterous relationship. Uh, with his half-sister, and so Jesus is saying, no, Herod is not this guy, and by the way, I'm totally poking at Herod, the typical politician. And you say, well, Pastor Martin, we don't live like 2,000 years ago. Uh, we don't have Herod Antipases around us. Oh, yeah? It totally applies today. So Jesus asked the second question, what then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing now catch this again, the humor and the irony of Jesus. The Greek term here, the adjective, is a term that would mean even effeminate. So Jesus is seriously, seriously calling out Herod and other people who, you know, compromise with the political winds of the day because they're putting on soft clothing. They're not being the spiritual men and women they need to be, right? Um, so obviously John's in camel's hair clothing. You know, he's not putting on effeminate clothing. Jesus says, is that what you went out to see, a man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who are dressed in splendid clothing live in luxury uh, and are in king's courts. In other words, they're not in the kingdom of God. They prostituted themselves out to the power and the wealth of this world. In case you don't know this from Jesus' teaching, he says people who like to bedeck themselves well and basically sell themselves out to the world are not fit, okay, for the king. That's what he just said. 
He said, no, 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 my people are going to be different. What then did you go out to see? Now we're going to get to the answer. A prophet? Oh, yes, definitely a prophet. Not a reed blown by the wind, shaken by the wind. Not a guy decked out in cool clothing because he fits in with the powers of the world. No, 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 a prophet and more than a prophet. Jesus says, now I'm going to tell you who John is. And by implication, I'm going to tell you who I am. The forerunner of the king who comes to his house. The forerunner of God and God's Messiah coming to the temple. This is the one about whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Jesus is citing Malachi chapter 3. Let me give you Malachi 3, verses 1 through 3. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, says the Lord. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. What would the Lord's going to come to his temple? Who's that going to be? That's going to be Jesus. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, like a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. In other words, burning out the dross. And they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Now let's go to Luke 7, 27 and 28, the fullness of these two verses. Jesus has just, as I told you, identified himself, and he's identified us, all of us who are people born to the kingdom of God. And he says this, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Least in the kingdom is greater than John the Baptist. What? First of all, you're going to think about yourself, right? And yes, Jesus is saying he is, this, is, this is applicable to you and to me. But let's go up, upstairs, so to speak. Jesus is speaking initially most directly to his own apostles and disciples. And ultimately, he is speaking about himself. What do you mean? I mean this. Jesus is teaching over and over and will continue to teach over and over that he, Jesus, as the Lord and as the King, is the servant of all. He will even go so far as to wash his apostles' feet the night before he goes to the cross. And he will teach you that if you want to be his disciple, you must be the servant of all. To James and John, who are jockeying to try to sit on Jesus' right and left, Jesus is going to say, if you want to be the greatest in the kingdom, you have to be the least. And Paul the apostle is going to get it, and he's going to say, I'm not only the least of the apostles, I'm the least in the whole household. See, if you're going to be with Jesus, and if you're going to follow Jesus, you're going to be the least and the servant of all, as Jesus teaches us. You don't take the first place. You don't want to bump up to the front of the line. You know, you follow Jesus in the way of service and giving yourself away. So Jesus says, what you have to understand is to follow me into the kingdom. Come, be with me in the way of the cross, in service to others, in not arrogating everything to yourself, like Herod Antipas and like most people do nowadays. So now let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Verse 15, this verse, of course, struck my attention in in counterbalance to the reed shaken by the wind image. This is the buttress and pillar of God's truth. God's church stands for truth, openly and solidly in Christ. Let me tell you what I mean by that. First of all, you can follow along in the notes, fill it in. This may help ingrain it in your memory. God's household equals what? according to 1 Timothy 3.15. God's household, in other words, God's family, okay, equals what? And the answer is the church of the living God. So God's household, God's family, is the church, and notice that, living God. Paul is writing to Timothy in Ephesus. There are hundreds of gods and goddesses worshiped in Ephesus. There are temples all over the place, every god and goddess you can imagine. Uh, Ephesus had more temples than any other city in Asia Minor. 
and it was most noted for one of the seven wonders of the world, the great temple to the goddess Artemis or Diana. Okay? So he's saying, you're a house, a temple belonging to the living God, not these false gods and goddesses. That's what Paul is saying. Remember this, Timothy. Remember this, church. The church of the living God is the family of God. And then the church of the living God equals what? Building. Think building. Okay? Fill in the blanks. Pillar and buttress, or you could say bulwark, of the truth. Pillar and buttress of the truth. And that's why I say solidly and openly, openly and solidly. Let me explain. Um, a pillar is open and visible for sure. And let's talk about pillar for a minute. If you know your Old Testament, you'll remember this. When Solomon builds the temple, the two pillars of the temple, of Solomon's temple, are named what? No? Yaquin and Boaz. Why? Well, there's a message there. And if you come on Wednesday night, you know the Boaz answer. You know what Boaz name means, remember? So let's, let's put these two together. He shall establish, Yaquin, he shall establish. In other words, he's going to lay the foundation. God is. Okay, Yaquin, he shall establish Boaz in his strength. Remember, we're studying Ruth on Wednesday nights. Boaz means in him or in his strength strength okay so in other words the two pillars of god's temple are he shall establish in his strength got it buttress bulwark solid to the foundation and flying forth in open proclamation paul says i'm writing these things to you after talking about like the standards for elders and deacons and leaders in the church, well, he flows into this, which is the centerpiece theologically of the whole letter. If I'm delayed, I write so that you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of truth. Paul's addressed these standards for the leaders. Now he talks about what basically the church is. And he takes us to the foundation literally of our calling together as the church to be the pillar and buttress of God's truth. The scriptures and ultimately the author and object of God's word, the word of truth himself, Jesus Christ. Hedreoma, the buttress or bulwark, is connected centrally, is part and parcel with the foundation. In other words, God's truth has to be at the foundation of what we teach, preach, believe, and live out in the world. Okay? But that takes us to the pillar. What is the pillar? The pillar is openly obvious, not only to the people inside the building, but to the world. Because the pillars in temples are seen by everybody out there. So Paul is saying, look, you've got to be faithful to the truth at your very core of what you teach and do and believe and pray, but you also have to witness it to the world. Get it? Buttress and pillar. The, the second with the stilos, the, the pillar is open and obvious. And he, Paul is writing to people in Ephesus who have temples all over the place. The most famous temple, the temple of Artemis or Diana, one of the seven wonders of the world had how many pillars? 100. Anytime you got close to Ephesus, you saw this huge temple with these, it's one of the seven wonders of the world, all these pillars. And Paul is saying, look, church, I know you're a lot smaller than all the people who follow Artemis, but you, in your very being, need to be a pillar, a public, open proclamation of your Christianity to the world. And of God's truth, even when the world doesn't want to hear God's truth. That's, that's what Paul is saying. That's what God's word is saying here. 
Be faithful to the truth, even when nobody else is, even when people in the church turn away from it, so for the so-called traditional church, traditional denominations, and non-denominational churches. In the last 10 years, the flux and the flow to the wind is incredible. But God is calling us to his truth. You hear what I'm saying? So the church holds the truth aloft, unashamed of Jesus, unashamed of who he is as the truth, unashamed of the very word of God that runs counter to what the winds of culture are telling us now that we've got to bow down to. He is our truth. Writing to the same church, Paul in Ephesians 1.13 says this, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, what's the word of truth? The gospel of our salvation in Jesus. And believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. So truth equals the word of truth, equals the gospel of your salvation, which is all in the ultimate truth, Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14, 6. He is the true north to the Lord and to heavenly communion. Our true north. Hebrews 13, verse 8. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hold fast to him. We stand together for truth in him. That's what communion is about. Tonight, in youth, Dean's going to be talking to the youth about Daniel chapter 3 and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those are their pagan names, given pagan names in Babylon. Their real names are Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Okay? They stick together against what everybody else says and does and refuse to bow down to the idol. They refuse to be reeds shaken by the wind. And they stick together in communion in the truth of the living God. And it's important because I gotta tell you, even though we're called to be greater than John, I gotta tell you, I'm not that strong normally. You may not be that strong. It really helps to have at least one or two friends who are also holding to the truth. And that's what we see in Daniel chapter three. So I invite you today as we prepare to come to the Lord's table May we as a church, as a church family, and may you and your own household stand for truth together in Jesus. He is our truth. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you, and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.